Hello to you all, and I hope this is working properly. And welcome to this session on open government. Uh, open data is supports, but is not open government. My name is Duff Conacher. I'm co-founder of Democracy Watch. And I am presenting on this uh, issue for the simple reason that uh, Democracy Watch works on the issue of open government. And so it's a presentation, uh, but also a plea and an invitation to the open uh, data uh, networks across the country to uh, join with us in our work on open government, in particular, uh, on a few key issues where I think the open data networks have not uh, really focused or realized um, just how bad things are. So what I'm going to do is uh, present um, just for 15 minutes or so, and then open it up to questions from anyone and uh, discussions and, and uh, any points that anyone else would like to make. So uh, the three areas that I wanted to highlight are uh, first, the areas of lobbying. And secondly, the area of government ethics, particularly conflict of interest disclosures. And third, uh, the area of access to information overall. And I'll just spend five minutes on each and then uh, open up uh, things to uh, questions from anyone who is uh, wanting to make questions or respond to uh, what I'm presenting. So the first area of lobbying uh, actually, I think, meets a lot of the best practice uh, standards of open data. There is a public registry. It's online. And again, I, I'm focusing on the federal government, but the same thing is applicable to several uh, provincial governments that have lobbying laws. And the data can be obtained in various forms. Uh, the lobbying registry is available in a raw data form so that it can be searched in various ways and downloaded from the site. Uh, the uh, issue, though, with the lobbying registry is that it is not a registry of lobbyists, which is what it's called, or lobbying. It's only a registry of some lobbying because it is a, uh, the lobbying law has several loopholes in it, which mean that many people who are lobbying and organizations and businesses that are lobbying do not have to disclose details of their lobbying or disclose their lobbying at all. And I'll just go through a few of those loopholes. First, if you are not paid to lobby, you don't have to register your lobbying. And that is uh, a huge loophole because all you have to do as a contract for hire lobbyist is have your contract say you're being paid for giving strategic advice and you're doing the lobbying for free and then the lobbying law does not apply to you. Secondly, if you are lobbying about the enforcement of a law or regulation or other rule uh, in law that applies to you, you do not have to register your lobbying. And that is, uh, of course, a huge area of lobbying for businesses who lobby about being inspected, audited, et cetera. And most of these loopholes are in place to hide the extent of big business lobbying. You also don't have to register uh, the details of lobbying, how many people are lobbying a business from a business. Uh, if uh, the only people that have to be listed in a registration are those who are lobbying more than 20% of their work time. And so a, a corporation can have 100 people lobbying 19% of their work time, and none of them will be listed in the registry. 
And this is, these are all serious loopholes because if you are not in the registry, not required to be, then the ethics rules for lobbying do not apply to you and you're allowed to fundraise for and campaign for uh, politicians and parties you're lobbying. And all of that is done can be done essentially in secret unless a whistleblower blows a whistle on how you're helping a party or a politician. Uh, and it's all legal to do secret unethical lobbying. So again, it's a best practice registry in terms of open data standards, online, uh, searchable. The raw data can be downloaded and uh, searched in various formats, but it's not an open government system because it allows for rampant secret lobbying and therefore also unethical lobbying. Turning to uh, the area of ethics and disclosure of financial interests, which are the primary interests that will cause conflicts of interest for any politician. This is also uh, in some ways a best practice uh, open data system at the federal level and in, in several provinces. The financial interests have to be disclosed to usually what's called an ethics or integrity commissioner, ethics commissioner at the federal level. And the commissioner posts it on a registry that's searchable. Uh, the raw data can be downloaded and, and searched and manipulated for patterns. And uh, the information is up there for all the cabinet ministers, uh, also top government officials, so cabinet staff, cabinet appointees, deputy ministers, assistant deputy ministers, all of whom are covered by the Conflict of Interest Act, the federal law. But what's missing from the data? Well, there's only a disclosure of uh, very, very general information, no asset or liability of a politician that's under ten, valued under $10,000 is disclosed. Politicians are let, allowed to set up what are called blind trusts, but they're not actually blind trusts. The politicians know what they put in their trust. They choose the trustee and they can give the trustee instructions about what to do with the shares or other investments in the stock market that they might have in the blind trust. The contents of the blind trust are not disclosed. And uh, also politicians are allowed to invest in mutual funds that even if they are regulating the businesses that the mutual fund invests in, it's a loophole in the rules and they're not required to disclose those investments. Uh, to give a comparison in the United States, they also have an online registry of these financial interests of politicians, but they have to disclose all of their investments, not just some of them. So again, you have a, a best practice open data system, but it's not an open government system because of the secrecy that is allowed uh, under the system. And uh, again, why I'm presenting on this issue is it's a, an, a presentation, but also an appeal and invitation to the open data community to take a good hard look at uh, the system that they're examining and calling for in terms of open data and learn about possible loopholes in the information government is gathering. Because open data only discloses the government that gather, the data that government gathers. And if government leaves out key data, then it's not really an open data system because all sorts of operations of government are still secret. The third big area that I'll finish my presentation on is the Access to Information Act overall. Uh, every review of the act by information commissioners, experts in the field, the media uh, and uh, interest groups, advocacy groups like Democracy Watch has concluded that there are way too many loopholes that allow for secrecy, allow for information that the public has paid for to be gathered by government officials to be kept secret from the public. The, the, the act, I mentioned that the, the lobbying law uh, is only really covers some lobbying. It's called the Lobbying Act. It really should be called the Some Lobbying Act. The Conflict of Interest Act uh, should be uh, the uh, Conflicts of Interest, some of which are kept secret act is what it should be called. And the Access to Information Act at the federal level or Freedom of Information Act, as it's called in some provinces, it really should be called the guide to keeping information secret from the public that the public has a right to know. 
uh, Act. That really should be the name of it because so much information is allowed to be kept secret. And so there's been a broad call in the open data, open government movement uh, to have act, the information that is disclosed under access to information put up on uh, line, proactively disclosed. There is a registry. You can go and search it uh, for any access information request that has been fulfilled and find the information that was disclosed to whoever requested it and, and get, obtain that information yourself. You don't have to request it again. It's a searchable registry and again, matches many of the open data uh, uh, standards. But because the Access Information Act is full of loopholes, it's again, not an open data system really, because it is allowing data that the government has to be hidden legally under a federal law. So those are the three areas uh, that I'm focusing on that uh, I think should be of interest to everyone in open data uh, because they cover three key areas of democratic good governance, transparency, and including of lobbying and uh, conflicts of interest, and ethical government as a result because of the lobbying and, and, and government ethics uh, uh, systems and the loopholes in them. And the Access to Information Act is the key open government law that, again, is so full of loopholes that it really uh, is um, a system that uh, is, is uh, allowing information to be hidden from the public that the public has a clear right to know. And I, in, again, invite an appeal to the open data movement to join the call for all of these loopholes to be closed, because until they are, we won't really have uh, an open data uh, system uh, because the data is missing that the public has a clear right to know and that government has or could gather by closing loopholes. So uh, I welcome uh, any questions that you uh, you have. I see a couple of notes and um, I see someone uh, noting that uh, Lobbying is problematic because it lumps civil society organizations with the private sector. Uh, there are different standards between the private sector and civil society organizations. Believe it or not, the disclosure standards are actually higher for civil society organizations than for big businesses. I mentioned the 20% loophole rule where if a business has uh, uh, people working and who are lobbying only less than 20% of their time, they do not have to be listed in the registry. When uh, you are working at a nonprofit civil society organization, uh, let's say that organization has 10 staff people, any lobbying activity by any one of those 10 staff people is combined together and the law requires you to pretend they're one person and you add up all of their time lobbying, and if it adds up to more than 20%, then uh, the everyone has to be registered, all 10 of the people. Whereas for a business, if they have 10 people lobbying, none of them have to be listed in the registry unless each one of them is lobbying um, more than 20% of their time. And uh, so actually for civil society organizations, there's a requirement to disclose who is lobbying in more detail and more frequently uh, than for a big business. So in a civil society organization, if you add those 10 people and they reach lobbying 2.1% of their time, 10 times 2.1 equals 21% across the threshold and all 10 would have to be listed in the uh, lobbying disclosure uh, registry. Uh, that's one of the examples of how these uh, loopholes are being left open to hide big business lobbying more than uh, more than the uh, uh, lobbying by civil society organizations, even though just based companies in, in Canada are responsible for uh, thousands of the lobbyists in the registry and thousands more who are not in the registry likely, again, because of the loopholes. Uh, 
but, but the law is aimed more at civil society uh, lobbyists who have about one, there's about one uh, civil society lobbyist for every hundred or so big business lobbyists in Canada. And yet their disclosure standards are higher for those civil society lobbyists. I see another note uh, that the open government partnership tends to focus on open data, not open government. And yes, uh, Democracy Watch has appealed in the past to uh, the open government partnership to reject the Canadian government's plan because the Canadian government's plan since they first joined the open government, part, international open government partnership, their plans have focused on open data and not open government. Nothing about closing these loopholes in the lobbying, the ethics law, or the Access to Information Act. And the current uh, plan that is being developed right now is also still focused on largely on open data. And the Open Government Partnership is, despite its name, is allowing them to get away with it again and again, set very, very minimal uh, goals, and then also not even fulfill those goals. Um, it's been a great disappointment. And Democracy Watch has not spent a lot of time on this international open government partnership because it really has uh, rolled over and let the um, the government of Canada off the hook for rampant secrecy and failing to close clear loopholes that are have to be closed if you're going to have any basic standard of democratic good government. Uh, I see another question with regard to a jurisdiction that offers a better standard with respect to these issues. Uh, and Ireland is mentioned. Ireland certainly has one of the best whistleblower protection uh, rules. The US is better than Canada in access to information. There are fewer loopholes and a stronger enforcement system. And uh, the um, uh, Toronto, City of Toronto requires uh, all lobbying to be disclosed, whether it's paid or unpaid. So we do have an example in Canada where uh, unpaid lobbying, if it's, even if it's a volunteer lobbying, is required to be disclosed in their registry. And it's uh, a good um, standard to have because volunteer lobbying, as I mentioned, not only easy to do by doing a contract that says uh, that if you uh, that you're being paid just for strategic advice and not uh, for your lobbying and therefore are able to exploit that loophole and lobby in secret. But also volunteer lobbying is often done by retired executives at big businesses uh, who are still receiving a pension from the company, but that's not considered to be payment for lobbying because it's their pension. And if they've been around for a long time, uh, they may still have a seat on the board uh, or just be a retired executive still loyal to the company. And if they were around the company before they retired for a long time, they likely know a lot of people in politics and are friends with them, might have helped fundraise for them in the past, uh, supported the party or the politician in some way, and they can make a quick call. And that call will be powerful because of who it's coming from and the relationship that they have. So, uh, Toronto again is a is an is a city that has uh, uh, closed that loophole. It does have another loophole open that allows uh, lobbying for a certain period of time without having to register. There really shouldn't be any lobbying allowed for even one minute because again that call from a former CEO of a big business to some politicians they or party they've supported for a long time can be very powerful even if it's just a one minute call. And uh, in these areas, lots of people say, oh, but you know, show me the examples where governments have done these favors for businesses. And what a lot of people don't realize, including a lot of people in the media, is the favor can very simply be in a lot of cases inaction. You just don't regulate the business in the public interest. So you haven't done anything for the business in terms of changing a rule to help them. You just haven't put a rule in place in the first, uh, in the first place that it requires them to do anything in terms of protecting the public interest. Uh, and that inaction, of course, doesn't get covered by the media usually because it's inaction. So there's no news. Nothing's happened. The government hasn't done anything. And uh, it's a very big way that governments can help businesses. Uh, and 
that lobbying for inaction can be done in secret because of these loopholes. And as well, uh, as I mentioned, top government officials, cabinet ministers, their staff and appointees can all be invested in a business that they're watching over. The Minister of Finance is allowed to own a million dollars worth of shares or more in, in banks and also change the Bank Act because of huge loopholes in the, uh, in, in the conflict of interest system that allow for owning the shares through a mutual fund and not disclosing them and also taking part in decisions that uh, change the laws for banks. And so, um, again, that's disclosed in the U.S. by politicians. There have been several scandals, if you Google them, uh, by Nancy Pelosi and others, uh, including during the pandemic, where a senator was uh, promoting a certain company while also being invested in it. And uh, the rules are stronger down there in the U.S. that senator is currently being investigated for violating the ethics code rules, whereas in Canada, even if you did find out that the finance minister owned a bunch of bank stock and was making changes to the bank's banking law, the Bank Act, that would make the banks a whole bunch more money and increase the price of the shares, then uh, in Canada, even if that was found out, the uh, it's actually legal for the finance minister to do that. So, uh, again, these three big areas, secret lobbying, secrecy concerning the financial interests and therefore financial conflicts of interest of politicians and the overall secrecy of, under the Access to Information Act, the overall system has, uh, has um, certainly been uh, uh, viewed by mo many people to be broken and really be a government secrecy system. I appeal to the open data uh, community to join in the call. Uh, there's a coalition right now. The Center for Free Expression at Ryerson University has a Right to Know Alliance going. If you're involved with any organizations, you can join that by contacting the Center for Free Expression at Ryerson University. Democracy Watch has the Open Government Coalition. Uh, and you can see that on our Open Government Campaign on the democracywatch.ca website. We also have a government ethics campaign calling for closure of these loopholes in the lobbying and ethics rules. And uh, of course, you can always uh, contact your own MP and your own MP's office. We also have a government ethics coalition that is pushing for these issues. And there are lots of groups out there. The Canadian Association of Journalists is also pushing on access to information. Uh, and uh, the, the whole Right to Know Alliance, as I mentioned. So I, I will put links up in the next few minutes uh, to these uh, website and web pages on Democracy Watch's site that you can uh, check out, but it's all there on democracywatch.ca. You just click on campaigns and you'll see the open government campaign, the government ethics campaign. And again, I mentioned the Center for, for Free Expression. It's a new alliance. Uh, and it is uh, the more the merrier in terms of pushing for these things because the governments are all resisting them very much. They want power without accountability and transparency is a major form of accountability. And uh, they are quite happy to keep highlighting open data changes because all that means is taking records that are already available and making them more easily available. It doesn't change the level of secrecy in a government at all. It just changes the accessibility of information. And what we need to do to actually have an open data system in Canada is, is close loopholes to uh, remove uh, all of these secrecy uh, loopholes that keep the public from uh, having easy access to information they have a right to know. And that is essential to know in order to have democratic good government and accountable government. So again, uh, thank you for your interest and uh, happy to answer other questions if you want to post them in the chat. And as I mentioned, I'll just post a couple of key links in the chat as well uh, that where you can find uh, this information and share it. And of course, Democracy Watch has all the usual uh, social media accounts where you can sign and share uh, the information as well for any of our campaigns. 
many of which have a transparency uh, element to them. I've just mentioned a few of the key ones that are really uh, should be highlighted. It's uh, because they're so key to get democratic good government. And of course, press any officials uh, that you know in government as well. Uh, the consultation that's gone on with Open Government Partnership, uh, the plan hasn't come out yet. It's still possible to send emails in to the Open Government team and say, make this a plan about Open Government, not just about Open Data, because Open Data supports, but is not Open Government. Uh, welcome any other questions you may have in these last few minutes. And thank you for your interest in this uh, key topic that uh, connects the open data and open government movements together. And I'll just watch the uh, chat now to see if you have any other uh, questions or points that you would like me to address. Yes, the Queen's printer issue has been raised. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly the key problem that is being raised with the Queen's printer. Um, the Canada Gazette, I believe, is available online, if that's what you're talking about. But if uh, the person raising that, oh, copyright. Sorry, not an issue I'm expert in with regard to the Queen's printer. Um, but I'm happy to uh, just uh, talk about it further if you want to contact me at info at democracywatch.ca because we're always happy to add elements to our call for key changes under our open government campaign or others. Um, oh, I see a lot of content can be scraped that runs afoul of Queen's printer rules. Yes, it's not an issue I've examined. I'm, I'm happy to hear more about it. Uh, the power imbalance on this issue Overall, uh, like any issue, if politicians hear from enough voters, unless they're ideologues, uh, they usually will reverse if it threatens their re-election. It's hard to get an uh, interest in this issue. I've been appealing to the media to run a secrecy sidebar uh, article with every article they run about um, something that is uh, they've discovered within government information and the little article on the side would say here's what you don't know because you don't have a right to know it so media doesn't really cover secrecy they cover what they found and this would be a way to highlight that every time they find something they, they wanted to find more but they couldn't because of the law and i'm hoping the canadian association of journalists and uh, the newspaper association will start doing that it's an easy thing to do with online articles because you have more time, uh, more space other than in a print edition. And they could compile it, compile it all together and make it easily searchable. Uh, so that's a major thing to just raise the public's awareness of these loopholes and how bad it is and how little information we actually have a right to know that we should have a right to know. So thank you again for your interest. Uh, the session is going to end in less than a minute. And happy to connect with any of you. Again, info at democracywatch.ca, just send me an email and I'll connect you in with the Right to Know Alliance and, and others working in the open government field. And happy to discuss further issues as well uh, that you see as problems with loopholes or flaws in the current federal laws. Thank you again for the opportunity. Take care and stay safe.